Thank you so much. Um, I express my joy to be here in this. Um, although I'm still getting used to talking to my laptop, but somehow <clears throat> it is also so nice that um, this medium seems to bring us close. Um, I'm also very honored um, for being invited by the university to talk about mind training. Um, obviously, the mind training is one of the most extensive, vast, and deep subject in Buddhism. Um, so we will not be able to kind of uh, do it, um, I don't know, uh, completely, let's call it, <clears throat> within short time. But um, I think talking about mind, even for few minutes, it's so uh, worthwhile in this day and age when all we talk and think and dream about is something that is not mind. Um, there. I'm a Buddhist, as you know, and um, I guess this is sort of an oxymoron. But um, I'm kind of being very proud for being a follower of the Buddha, and there are a lot of reasons. Among them. The chief reason for being really proud to be the follower of the Buddha is perhaps in Buddhism, the subject matters regarding the mind is probably most discussed, analyzed in both sort of critical and deconstructive and analytical and academic. And also, at the same time, centuries and centuries of tradition of actually putting uh, mind training or these theory or philosophy into practice uh, I think, I think it is safe to say that regarding the mind in India and China probably really excels. Um, I think, I don't know, perhaps I'm wrong. I'm still sort of exploring this. Perhaps the deep study of mind in, in the West, in Europe, even including uh, Greeks, maybe may have come much later or definitely not, not as extensive as what you will find in Buddhism or maybe I think in Taoism. Now, I realize that I'm talking to uh, Hong Kong University students, and um, I guess the university students here, they consider themselves as, uh, you know, modernized, modern people, let's call them. Now, these days, 
And this is something I have been sort of expressing everywhere. Um, being a modern and being westernized some, somehow seems to have become so intertwined. Many times uh, we in Asia, we think that being modern is is same as being west being western being western um <clears throat> and sometimes even the westerners they sort of exude that being modern means being western now i'm bringing this subject because it is quite important with uh, this issue of mind that we are discussing today. Because if you consider yourself as, I don't know, modern, westernized, scientific, anyway, the <clears throat> methodology that we now use in, you know, learning centers such as you know, Hong Kong University or Singapore University, I am more, I am assuming students here who are listening today and I, as a Buddhist, when I say mind and when you hear my word mind, I think we are not really coming to a mutual agreement. So this is going to be a little difficult I may be talking about orange and you may be hearing uh, about, I don't know, asteroid. And this is something that I see as a fundamental challenge. Um, <clears throat> so be actually, before we even talk about training the mind, what are we talking, uh, you know, what is mind? That is uh, something that we need to at least begin to ask the question. We may not come to a conclusion, what is mind today? But that is uh, something that we need to really discuss. Because I think it really, really reflects in everything that we do. One example, for instance, and again, this is my speculation. So Hong Kong universities, uh, faculties and the students, please help me uh, to, I don't know, uh, to correct me or I don't know, find um, some sort of, a, I don't know, information regarding this. For instance, um, in the European a renaissance, uh, like for instance, paintings. Uh, in the early time, the painters painted sort of, you know, gods and, you know, angels flying and all that kind of thing. And then later, uh, in the, you know, sort of modern Europe, people pride themselves for not being so-called spiritual, spiritualist. Pride themselves, call, uh, you know, calling themselves secularist. So the painter painting, painters begin to paint landscapes instead of gods and angels. And these Paintings like a Monet, I don't know, I'm sure, I, I don't know so much about the Western art, but these are considered like a secular paintings, right? Now, if you are thinking about China, we are talking about even 2000 years ago, Chinese were already painting landscapes, mountains, clouds, mist, I don't know, all these, you know, bamboos. And they paint this again and again and again. It's almost, and from what I gather is that Chinese landscape painting 
was a spiritual matter for them. It was it was something to do with the mind. Is so I'm just giving you this as an example. The idea of secular or spiritual as in religion, right? Um Some of you may have heard me telling you this. In India, the word mind, term mind, I was astonished to find uh, or discovered that India had more than 52 words to refer mind. Now that is very rich. So I think these are something that university students should really um, <clears throat> pay some attention because now more than ever, mind is going to be really, really a big issue. We are talking about AI re revolution. We are talking about I mean, we don't even have to wait for AI revolution. Uh, one of the biggest, the other day I was discussing this in Tokyo, one of the biggest challenge in our modern world is challenge of identity. Identity crisis is perhaps the most difficult one. If you look I mean, the wars that are being fought even today, as we speak, most of it may be something to do with the identity. <clears throat> um, and um, this identity, a lot of our identity has something, is something connected to or is something to do with mind, obviously. It's how we think of ourselves. It's about how we, I don't know, even, you know, questions like, who are we? What are we? When did we come here? What is purpose? What is the meaning? Obviously, we are not talking about some material when we talk about such a profound questions like the purpose. And then as a sort of a, because of this, you know, we have so many other um, identity related Sort of challenges. For instance, why do we feel we need to fit in to a certain society? Um, why do we have to feel? Uh, why do why do we feel that we need to act certain way? Um, why do we feel alienated, even though there is just so much a choice? Especially some of us, people who live in a free, free world, we are supposedly adorned with so many choice. The choice to, you know, the food, the sh clothing, the news, uh, that we can read, books that we can read, yet we get more and more alienated. And when we get alienated, who is it that is getting alienated? What is it that is getting alienated? So these are important questions. Anyway, <clears throat> since uh, I'm expected to talk about Buddhist mind training. For Buddhism, 
as I said earlier, there is a really an extensive study of mind. What is mind? The question, question such as what is mind was asked and the answers were begin, answers were given in many, many stages. Um, I guess that is another day's topic. But here today, why do we need to train our mind? What's the purpose of training our mind? For Buddhism, um, training the mind is really a, is fundamentally something to do with knowing the truth. It's not just to make your mind malleable, sort of, you know, like, um, let's say you are a short temper. Then you train your mind so that you make your temper not short. Let's say you are a moody person. So you, I don't know, meditate, mind train, so that you become not moody, so on and so forth. That is for Buddhism, it is a it if it if it happens, it's okay, it's good, it's good for you. It's 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 why not? Why should we be moody? Why should we be, you know, like <clears throat> short tempered? Why should we be depressed? So on and so forth. But that is not the real goal for Buddhism. For Buddhism, mind the real goal of mind training is actually to see the truth. And some of you have heard me saying this, repeating this again and again like a mantra, but this is important. Seeing the truth is the only thing that is, con that, uh, is the uh, concern of so-called Buddha Dharma, Buddhist way. Because if you have no clue, if you don't have the right picture, if you, in other words, if you, if you haven't seen the truth, then obviously you have a false conclusion. You have a wrong view, you have a mistaken conclusion. Now, based on mistaken conclusion, mistaken view, mistaken idea, if you act with that kind of, uh, you know, conclusion or a, a decision, we know where, we'll, where we will reach, we will end up reaching disappointment. It will only lead us to disappointment. But you know, we human beings, I mean, we sentient beings, we have developed what we call the habit of hope and fear. It doesn't matter how many times we have been disappointed, we still hope that one day it's going to sort of stop. So this is how we <clears throat> get entangled, so to speak. And as we get entangled, in other words, as we, get, as we go further and further from the truth, then we get more and more and deeper and deeper into um, delusion confusion and this delusion this confusion is what makes us anxious what makes us uh, depressed um, panic um, this is also what makes us proud 
at times. This is also what makes us lose confidence. Um, this is also what makes us develop so many prejudices. Now, when I talk about understanding the truth, some of you may think, especially those who are new here, you may think that like all the religion, they always have some exotic, magical, mythical truth. That is not the case in Buddhism. When we talk about the truth, we are talking about something so mundane, something so ordinary. But in fact, this is the problem. Because this is so mundane, simple, it is so, what do you call it, ordinary. This is why we end up not seeing them. Like many Buddhist masters have said it again and again, like sometimes when things are too close to you, you don't see it, like eyelashes. You don't see eyelashes. Likewise, sometimes the truth is so close, so simple, so mundane, so ordinary, that we don't see it. And while we don't see this simple, mundane truth, together, simultaneously, we also, I don't know, we also develop the idea of the truth, something exotic, something, I don't know, um, <laughs> supernatural, something, um, I don't know, we give them very, uh, you know, like uh, colorful names like prajna, wisdom, um, like uh, all kinds of, um, you know, like um, exotic names. And then this is how I think even a very simple uh, what do you call it, I, uh, simple instructions of the Buddha get so distorted. Just before our um, gathering here today, um, I overheard the staff talking about one of your event being discussion of the teachings based on uh, this just sitting. Now you see that technique of just sitting is another wonderful, profound uh, dealing with the mind in the most fundamental way. I mean, you can even um, detect this by um, if you pay some attention to words like just, nothing exotic, nothing colorful, nothing holy, nothing magical, it's just sitting. Okay, now, so for the sake of the new uh, listeners, mm. what are the truths we are talking about? Now, this is, of course, a big subject. We will not be able to, um, what do you call it, um, cover everything, but... Um, um, We are, okay, again, even though I have just, you know, a moment ago talked about uh, sometimes we make, we create a lot of exotic labels. Here I, here I go, I'm, I am myself giving you some exotic labels. And probably, perhaps some of these labels might, um, for some of the students, trigger some curiosity and uh, hopefully, you know, you will be intrigued and uh, explore more. But anyway, for now, we are talking about the truth of anicca, dukkha, anicca, uh, anicca, dukkha and anatta. We are talking about basically the truth that everything is changeable. 
Now that is so fundamental. That is so mundane. So when we talk about mind training here, and here this is something that I wanted to emphasize. Every time Buddhists talk about mind training these days, immediately people jump into some sort of a discipline that involves sitting straight, like a certain posture, going to a <clears throat> quiet place, sitting on a, what we call zafu, the meditation cushion, or close eyes or whatever, you know, put, put your hands in a certain mm, way. Yeah, of course, those things are all good. It's like, you know, they are, they are kind of a technique. They, are, they could help you. But the real mind training, the real mind training is actually knowing this truth. And, or actually I should say, real mind training is putting effort in knowing these truths. So in this, in this sense, even the discussion that we are having right now, you could actually call it dhyana, which is dhyana means, you know, like focusing. I don't know, meditation, I guess. The word meditation perhaps is not really doing the justice, <clears throat> translating the word dhyana. But anyway, even us discussing here, like, Everything is changeable. There's a nothing that, you know, stays frozen. Nothing. Your good experience changes. Your bad experience changes. I don't know. The, of course, the life changes. Of course, the tree, colors of the trees changes. These, some of these growth changes, you know. Some of these growth changes, you even appreciate. Don't we all appreciate autumn leaf? Don't we all uh, appreciate, uh, I don't know, the spring leaf? Don't we all sort of celebrate our birthdays? But other times the changes we don't like, like falling leaves probably trigger emotions, uh, old age, wrinkles, I don't know. Um, Falling, you know, the, you know, uh, falling up, uh, you know, friendship falling apart, uh, family, uh, you know, falling apart, um, all of that. But anyway, there is a change. Change is all the time. Not only with trees and mountains, but even the very mental factor that you right now are having. Even the very character that you are right now having. You, you know, there's a lot of characters in you. I'm sure you have a lot of values. Some of you must be so proud that you believe in a certain value. This is going to change. I myself, I'm a very good, you know, I think I'm a good example. I have changed so much in, uh, you know, like um, with my values, how I think of others, how I think about certain books, so on and so forth. Now, what is so great in knowing that? Right? That is the kind of question. Why? Okay, so everything changes. So what's so great about knowing that? If you know things changes, not just intellectually, not just academically, but if you know this practically, habitually, emotionally, let's say you are having a really good time with your family, right this very moment, having a tea, I don't know, birthday party. But if somewhere behind you, another watcher, let's say, just hypothetically, part of your mind is telling you, 
this is not going to last. This will change. Doesn't mean it will get worse. Probably it may get even better. Let's say you are having the toughest time in your life. Really, really tough. But part of your mind is talking to you. You know, so many bad things has happened before and none of them really stayed forever. This is also going to go. Not intellectually, not, emo uh, not academically, not as a study of, you know, not as a result of studying some books. But if you happen to have that in your head, this will change the way you look at life. This will change the way you shop. This will change the way you parent your children. This is going to change everything, where you paint your wall, or where you get excited or not get excited. I don't know. Now that, for Buddhism, is the result, or the we call it liberation. What are we getting liberated from? Liberating from this delusion of thinking that nothing, you know, okay, some things, okay, the trees will change, the skies will change, but my love for this person or are they, you know, the, I don't know, certain political value or this is, you know, like going to be forever. Like. So you liberate from your extreme, you know, sort of uh, lopsided, uh, you know, a view that basically is a byproduct of prejudice. That liberation, that freedom. You know, young people always talk about freedom. Freedom is so important nowadays. Individual freedom, society freedom. Now, and, and this frees you. This frees you from your own entanglement, your own delusion of thinking that something is going to work forever. But I don't know, you know, the thing is, some of these subjects, they get so misread or misinterpreted. So this is why, you know, many times I have also myself have heard People talking about how Buddhism is so, so pessimistic. Buddhism is always talking about death and dying and impermanence. I don't know what to make out of that. Should I really take it as a compliment? Because in a way, it is a compliment because Buddhism is talking about the truth. Truth sometimes is bitter. You don't want to hear the truth. But... Truth is more bitter if you are only looking a partial truth, right? If you can look at the truth with a bird's eyes view, it doesn't have to be bitter. It's so, uh, what do you call it? Uh, it actually gives you a sense of relief. And then, you know, we talk about life, living, leading a life. What do we mean by leading a life? Big part of leading the life is appreciating the life, appreciating everything, appreciating the fact that I'm looking through a window and I see this orange sky. That is incredible that I have the ability to see this sky today. That, you know, the incredible color of the orange color, just, you know, that I mean, that's just an amazing experience. And then suddenly a bird flew. And I've noticed that bird flew. And that momentary experience need to be appreciated. And where does this appreciation come from? When you know Anicca, when you know that 
things are always changeable. When you have it, make most of it. This is just one, one, just one small approach. Anyway, um, I should just quickly go through the other two, which is um, Dukkha, mm, the second one, Dukkha. Again here, this is a very big subject. According to Buddhism, one of the truths of our life is basically nothing will give us 100% satisfaction. Nothing. And that's an important message to know. That is a very important truth to know. Mind, we sh so here again, mind training basically means making, learning this, that nothing will give us 100% satisfaction. Not only learning intellectually or academically, but actually habitually, emotionally. If you can, if you are having, uh, um, let's say, satisfaction, big part, you know, big part of our problem is we are always expecting something will give us the hundred percent satisfaction, but that's not going to happen. But if you are if you are emotionally prepared, that nothing is going to give us a hundred percent satisfaction. So in this sense, even if 30%, if you, if you experience 30% of satisfaction, you are already very happy. You are actually, make, you are practically, pragmatically, and ide ideologically and romantically making this life worth, worthwhile to live. Otherwise, you will be always trying to get that 100% satisfaction, 100% perfection. And that's just going to occupy you. And you will even miss this 30%, 40%, 50%, all the way to even 90%. You are, all, you are always missing those satisfaction. This is just a, another one single a, a, you know, angle of seeing the truth. I mean, just the, the second truth, the truth of the dukkha alone, we could talk for days. So, just to remind ourselves, we are here to talk about so-called Buddhist mind training. And I just want to say that Although a lot of people seem to have this idea that Buddhist mind training has something to do with, you know, like sitting straight and being quiet. And it's really a lot to do with how you look at your life. Anyway, the third, anatta. Now, this is a, di a little difficult subject, probably, for a lot of some people. But anyway, I will try to make it sort of relatable. Basically, it is something to do with like how things appears out there is not exactly how the how it is. I mean, you know the expression of appearance is deceiving. How how things appears is not necessarily how it is. So <clears throat> This is this is a very important truth. You know, most of us, <clears throat> we always experience something, we see something, we hear something, we taste something, we, I don't know, <clears throat> we have a certain idea, we feel something. And whatever we see, we hear, we feel, we taste, we think that is the sort of external independent truth. Now, according to Buddhism, no, it's just your idea. It's just your hallucination, if you like. 
it's your imagination, it's your opinion. And this is the, just to tell yourself, no matter what kind of value you have, gender value, political value, religious value, I don't know, or art, music, just telling yourself that this is just your opinion, period. Nothing more, nothing less, just your opinion. Yes, Beethoven, Symphony Number no. 9, beautiful, fantastic. But that's my opinion. Um, that's, that's, you know, and my opinion came from where? From surroundings, friends, families, I don't know, shopping malls. We get, we are byproduct of, uh, you know, influences, brainwashings, um, people telling you this and that. And I think it's important that especially young people know that, and, and I don't know, maybe this is kind of a strange for me to speak because I'm speaking to university students here. Um, I mean, um, it, people who are academic. And what I'm basically saying is that this is what happens in the education world. You are getting brainwashed. It doesn't, I mean, I'm not saying it, I'm not saying it negatively completely, but that's what, that's what it is. Many of our books, many of our statistics, many of our so-called scientific findings are done by some dude somewhere, you know, far away from us. And then we sort of completely, 100% devotion, blind devotion, of course, of wearing, of course, like a academic and analytical hat. We do that, right? But anyway, even if you, if we could accept that this is just my opinion, I think that will make the person so liberated, not like, what do we call it, full of himself. Okay, what is a good person? When the person is not full of himself, when the person is not, what do you call it, uh, megalomaniac, when the, when the person is not narrow-minded, when the person is open-minded, is a good person, when the person is sympathetic, when the person is has an empathy. Yes, let, let me just conclude um, my presentation with the word empathy. Empathy is what is lacking in the world. Why? Because there is no quest for the truth. The truth that I was speaking earlier. Empathy, but I'm using the word empathy today, but probably most of the Buddhists may use the word compassion. Basically, we are talking about empathy. You know, people have all kinds of views, emotions, hope, fear, insecurity. Imagine if Joe Biden has an empathy with Putin or vice versa. There is a reason why they do certain things. You know, and you know, we are not the one of the reasons why we can't put our feet in someone else's shoes is because we are so stuck ourselves by our, with the, this reality that uh, uh, my own shoes. And worse, we try to, I don't know, impose our value 
to others and then things really can go wrong. Anyway, probably I'm getting a little bit more scattered. What I want to say is um, the I'm not here to really share with you. Um, I mean, time is also uh, short, so I'm not. I'm. I didn't intend it here to share. I I didn't come here to um, thinking that I will share technique of mind training as it is found in a certain sort of uh, tradition. Here today, I just wanted to. Um, give a, I don't know, food for thought for the students. When you think about mind training, instead of thinking as this is something Buddhist discipline, Buddhist ritual, it's really sort of a quest or a enthusiasm or a discipline to understand the world. In the with the fundamental truth, that to me is the real mind training. That to me is the real dhyana. Well, I think um, I've already spoken way over the too much, so uh, I, I believe there's questions. Um, if there is, I'm happy to answer for the next few minutes. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you, Rinpoche. It's so great to see you today. So I want to ask a question for everyone. Like before, we have some meditation class with different meditation ways, like just sitting, or I have other ways, like from like other, uh, like uh, Wei Yang Zong. Like there are different ways in Chan Buddhism to meditate. So which uh way we can choose, or is the best for us to choose to meditate? Because there's too many ways to meditate so i just feel confused thank you the actual as i said earlier some of these techniques such as sitting mm -hmm. how you sit where to put your hands all yeah. these different tradition tells you different and mm -hmm. all of them are really good i don't think mm -hmm. uh, you should really think whichever really inspires you i would say whichever really Whichever makes you feel more comfortable, you should just choose mm -hmm. that. But um, okay. I just want to come back to as long as it is helping you to understand the truth, mm -hmm. then yeah. that you, whatever you are doing is uh, worthy. But, mm -hmm. you know, many times monks or nuns or Buddhists could be sitting on a cushion again and again, hours and hours and hours. But if it's not helping them to understand this three truths that I was talking earlier, then it's, it's just a ritual. Mm. Thank you. So the goal is the most important thing. Thank you. Okay, uh, here are some questions. I think uh, because I just pick up, I can see. Uh, yeah, please, uh, if I cannot emote... Uh, control my emotion, what should I do to deal with it? Okay, this is a very important and big question. Um, I mean, I can't just, um, it's an important big question. Um, there's uh, so many answers for that, I don't know. Um, for now, given the situation, um, you can do two things. Okay, let me put it this way. One, why don't you do what we... Okay, so let's say you have a emotions, sadness, anger, whatever. Then at that time, why don't you uh, breathe in and out and then put your mind into breathing? Your mind goes there, here, come back to the breathing. Your mind goes here again, there again, come back to the breathing. That's one way that's sometimes called shamatha. Few minutes. Now, the other one, more towards the vipassana, is when there's anger or emotion comes, like a jealousy, whatever, then watch that emotion. Instead of breathing, watch that emotion. 
when you watch just watch do not alter do not fabricate do not try to get rid of do not try to adopt none of that just watch okay okay uh thanks venerable language yeah uh next question is um uh yeah ask the master um which way would it be uh, the best for the training to um disconnect or could the so-called get rid of uh, attachment and the uh, so-called craving and attachment which one uh should be uh, uh fast which one first or fast yeah <laughs> Ah, and slow is so individual. So I don't know how I will be answering this. Uh, again, here, this has so many, many techniques. I would choose what I just said earlier. When you have a craving, do the breathing, whatever, shamatha. And then the vipassana, towards the vipassana, you just watch the craving. So what I'm saying is, let's say you are craving, you are really having a desire then most probably you will condemn yourself. Oh, desire is not good. Craving is not good. Don't do that. Because by doing so, you are actually agitating the desire. And uh, how, to, how should I put? You are shaking the desire. And uh, sometimes these emotions, when you shake, they actually become more alive. Uh, I used to give, a, you know, there's a watch that you don't have to wind. Just moving your hand, it sort of automatically runs the watch. It's a bit like this. But if this watch, if you keep it in the drawer and not, not shake at all, then watch stops. It's a bit like this. Okay. Uh, okay. Yes, you have some, sorry. Uh, question next. I think it's an English question here. Uh, do you have any suggestion about how to train uh, mind training practically in daily life? Thank you. Um, apart from okay, so daily life. Okay, I'll try to sort of put an image. You get up in the morning, okay. You see your ceiling or you see your window. Maybe you should tell yourself, this may be the last day that you are looking at the window. You may not see it tomorrow. Not because you will die. In that also, you may die too, but not necessarily because of death. I don't know. Maybe that afternoon you might get a job from somewhere that requires moving out. Then I don't know, take shower, brush your teeth, make yourself, I don't know, presentable. And then when you find yourself presentable, just think that that's your opinion. You are thinking that people are going to like you, but that's not, that's your opinion. Surely you can go around and ask, do, do you like me? Some of them may politely say yes, but who knows whether they really like you, right? So you can do that. And let's say that morning you get a promotion in your job, or I don't know then maybe you can tell yourself, okay, that's good, but, you know, nothing's going to really give me a 100% satisfaction. Just, just let me remember this. Like that, I don't know, something like this may be good. Okay, I think the final question I sent here, um, if the member of the family are depressed and worry too much, how could the way member of the family help him or her? Depression. Wow. Such a big question and important question again. A 
again here there's so many answer i think if you are a meditator you may not believe this but i need to tell you this if you are a meditator let's say if you are a practitioner even 2 3 minutes in your house if there is a depressed people you carry on doing the meditation somehow when you do meditation that energy that calmness that coming to the truth in touch with the truth that has a certain power that will slowly permeate to the rest of the not only family maybe the whole city but you may be thinking i'm talking mambo jumbo but you know you should try it. 